Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. Well, hello everyone and welcome to my library. My name is Chinzy Dubois and today we're going to be discussing the idea of talking to the dead. Death is an incredibly painful process for the living to experience, something which only marks a microscopic moment in the deceased person's life story leaves such an aching sense of loss, emptiness and confusion for chapters of the lives it parted, which can span anywhere from days to decades to lifetimes. The immensity of grief leaves millions of people around the world aching for more, desperately seeking to rewind the clock, open the door and break through the fabric of time and space to reconnect with life which slumbers in the realm of the unknown. And in this vulnerable state, many turn to those who claim to have such powers, those who can reach the dead and hear them speak. And three people knew the power of tapping into this sense of longing more than anyone else at the time. And it all started off with two little girls, 14-year-old Margareta, known as Maggie Fox, and her 11-year-old sister, Catherine, known as Kate. Well, they weren't that old when they started exploiting vulnerable people's emotions, but they were that young when they started lying. The stories of how the event unfolded on the night of March 31st, 1848 vary wildly, but allow me to indulge your imaginations by quilting together the most elaborately detailed elements of them, but obviously take them with a pinch of salt. Maggie and Kate lived with their parents, John and Margaret, in a small one-bedroom farmhouse in a hamlet of Hinesville, New York. Now, it is said that the neighbours knew that the family had become troubled by some disturbing noises. Apparently, every morning in the very early hours before the sun even rose, the two little girls claimed that they were woken by loud thuds and creaks from their home, but the parents nor the girls could find the source of the sounds. Obviously, the little girls were losing sleep, and on March 31st, the girls were sent to bed early at 6pm, hoping to garner some extra hours of peace. But that was apparently when the eruption happened supposedly. The family claim, as did many elaborate stories, that the noises started reverberating throughout the cottage, engulfing the family from floor to ceiling. The door frames started to make cracking sounds and knocking pounded at the walls around them. Terrified that a demon had engulfed their home, Margaret sent her husband John to go fetch a neighbour and my, he came back with many. Within less than an hour, the Fox's home was surrounded by and filled with people, with as many, according to the author of Sherlock Holmes himself, Arthur Conan Doyle, documenting allegedly 70 to 80 people attending the scene in the early hours. Lit with nothing but candlelight, the community stood in horror at the noises echoing throughout the tiny cottage. But what was the noise? Well, that's where the little girls came in. Kate had claimed that there was a spirit communicating with them by making rapping noises on the walls and furniture of the house. Rapping and raps would then become the term that we'd use throughout seancing. So to test Kate's communication, her mother claimed to have asked spirit how many children she had, and the spirit rapped out the correct number and even when asked, gave the correct ages of each of the children. After a while, the girls claimed that the raps were caused by a disembodied spirit of a 31-year-old peddler who had been murdered for the sum of $500 and then buried beneath the house. But they were buried there long before the foxes lived there. It was by a previous tenant. Now, who was this peddler? Well, no one could remember. The fox's son, David, allegedly came up with the idea of sounding out the letters of the alphabet and asking the spirit to rap in accordance with the correct letters of their name. But they never completed the entire thing. All they got were the initials C and B. So as you can imagine, the rapping ended quite early in the alphabet. 
Now, as the weeks passed, neighbours began to gossip of the incident. And coincidentally, they all began to collectively remember that there had indeed once been a peddler passing through the town at that address, once upon a time. But of course, no one could remember when this happened or who the peddler was. But the neighbours were convinced of the hauntings. The fox's neighbour, William Dusler, cleared out the home and investigated the cellar two days after the incident and claimed that he heard the raps louder than ever. But he was the only one around. There was even a story going on about how their son David had once discovered bones and a set of human teeth when he was digging under the house one summer. As their stories of falsified memories came together, so too did the reality of the travelling peddler. And soon, a whole life was formed from and dissolved into the ether, breathing the life poured into it by the collective imagination. They even gave the peddler a full name, Charles B. Rosner, but no such record of a peddler with that name was ever found. But before we go any further, I'd like to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, which is Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy for you to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience and sell anything from products to content to time, all in one place and all on your terms. If you're new to building websites, you have nothing to fear. You can design a gorgeous, unique and professional looking website tailored to your brand thanks to Squarespace's blueprint. And with Squarespace's integrated and optimized SEO tools, you can get your new website launched and discovered quickly. And also, thankfully, you don't need to know anything about coding because Squarespace's next generation website editor, Fluid Engine, lets you drag and drop your content where you want it. So building a website's incredibly intuitive. And it doesn't matter whether you're using a desktop or your mobile, you can still do that. If you're a freelance creative wanting to launch your own courses, you can do it all on Squarespace. You can upload your videos and then put them behind a paywall. So say you want to have a one pie and you can charge according to your business structure, whether that's a subscription service or a one-time charge, whatever works for your brand. So whether you want to expand your business or just build a beautiful site for your blogging leisure, then go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash lady of the library to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or domain. The story of Hydesville haunting crept across the state until it reached the hands of an excited student reading it in a newspaper in Rochester. The student ran with the story to their music teacher, a woman called Leah Fish, who just so happened to be the eldest daughter of the Foxes. Baffled, Leah decided to take a trip to her family home, but found out they were no longer there. They had moved out of the home and started living with the brother, David, because apparently the family had moved out to escape the influx of intrigue surrounding their home. People were fascinated by the news of the two little girls who could speak to the dead, and they wanted to know all about them. Sadly, the family were not much more at peace at David's home, for the wrappings had followed the little girls there too. So all the family decided that Maggie and Kate should return to Rochester with Leah in the hopes of getting away from it all. But sure enough, the wrappings followed them there too. And soon, Leah discovered that she could also speak to the spirits. I know, fascinating. And such a power tapped into Leah's entrepreneurial spirit. Pun intended. First, Leah needed to build up their reputation and she did so through the help of family friends, Amy and Isaac Post, the two radical Hicksite Quakers who were leaders in the 19th century anti-slavery and women's rights movements. In the 1840s, the pair had hosted reform lecturers in their home, from William Lloyd Garrison to Frederick Douglass, Susan B. Anthony and Sojourner Truth. So by 1848, the couple welcomed the Fox sisters into their home and introduced them to a group of friends, all of whom believed in spiritualism and were deeply invested in the sisters' alleged abilities. 
Now, the girl's powers could not have appeared at a more prime time in the century. Spiritualism had become a popular idea by the 1840s, thanks to the ideas of the 18th century philosopher Emanuel Swedenborg, whose concept of the material world as a reflection of spiritual realities, what he called correspondences, was inspirational and served as an exciting alternative to mainstream religious ideas. His philosophy spoke to those who were attracted to creative, emotional, mystical impulses, which were very much prominent in the Romantic movement, as you see in the poets such as William Blake, Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Butler Yeats. Spiritualism rebelled against religious authority while still placing heavy emphasis on the immortality of the soul, only with a more radically individualistic outlook. As such, spiritualism was the only religion that saw women as equals at the time and allowed them to speak in public and championed their ideas as well as the abolition of slavery. However, that's not to say that it was all utopian and nor was the world utopian for women, particularly women who followed spiritualism. For example, Victoria Woodhull, a vocal spiritualist and the first woman to run for president, was dubbed Mrs. Satan for her belief in spiritualism, suffrage and the ideas of free love. Yet, by 1897, spiritualism would claim over 8 million followers, mostly women in middle to upper classes. Nevertheless, all that was to say that it was an excellently timed career opportunity for the Fox sisters who started earning a living from conducting seances, which swiftly became such a popular form of entertainment that it started to scale up to theatrical levels. In just November 1849, at Rochester's Corinthian Hall, Maggie and Kate demonstrated their powers to a paying audience of nearly 400 people. And once the newspapers began spreading the word about their event, the girls quickly became huge celebrities with performances around New York theatres. Horace Greeley, who was the prominent publisher of the Tribune and a politician, took great interest in the girls and became a kind of mentor to them, which allowed the women to start moving in much higher social circles, and also introduce them to alcohol. We'll come back to that later. By 1850, the girls attracted the attention of many notable figures, such as Sojourner Truth, Nathaniel Parker Willis, and William Lloyd Garrison. However, naturally, with such widespread fame came more cynical, critical eyes. Critics such as physician E. P. Longworthy, John W. Hearn, Reverend John M. Austin, and Reverend D. Potts started expressing their beliefs that the sounds emanated from the girls themselves. In fact, in the Tribune itself in 1851, Reverend C. Chauncey Burr wrote that cracking toe joints had the ability to be so loud that they could be heard in a large hall. Later that same year, the University of Buffalo investigated the girls and came to the conclusion that the sounds were indeed coming from the girls cracking their own joints. And they said that should the girls rest their feet on a pillow, the rappings would not occur. The pressure of the girls' fraudulence heightened when a relative of the Fox's family, Mrs. Norman Culver, confessed that she had helped the girls during seances by touching them when raps needed to be made. Culver claimed that the girls were indeed cracking their toes, knees and ankles to create the rapping sounds. And then, to make matters worse, patent examiner Charles Grafton Page published his observations in his 1853 book Psychomancy, in which he claimed that the rapping sounds distinctively emanated from beneath the girls' conveniently long skirts. Yet, despite all the criticism, despite all the studies and claims, the Fox sisters maintained some legitimacy and career. They were also bold and adamant about their own powers. You see, in 1857, when the Boston Courier set up a prize of $500 to any medium who could demonstrate a paranormal ability to their committee, the girls were confident enough in their scheme to present themselves. The committee included the magician and famed ventriloquist John Wyman, and as such, the committee were not a bunch of fools. 
They confidently dismiss the girls and saw straight through their act, failing them on the basis that they could tell the wrappings were coming from the feet movement. Within just a couple of years, the two young teenagers, Maggie and Kate, had found themselves turning to alcohol, all to save themselves from crumbling under pressure. They even attempted to escape the limelight very early on in November 1849 by spelling out, quote, we will now bid you farewell with their toe joints during a seance. But it would seem their older sister Leah wouldn't let them escape the circus that easily. Poor Maggie in particular suffered for it. After one seance, Maggie was almost kidnapped in Troy, New York by a gang of men who found her alleged powers ungodly and offensive. And Maggie, as you can imagine, was terrified. So, when she saw an opportunity to leave the industry, she took it. In October 1852, now aged 20 years old, Maggie was conducting a seance in Philadelphia when she met the physician and Arctic explorer Elisha Kent Kane. The pair fell in love and Maggie converted to Roman Catholicism for him and gave up her medium days to be with the love of her life. She attended a private academy in Philadelphia, whilst Elijah voyaged across the Arctic with 17 men on the 144-ton brigantine, the USS Advance, to find out the fate of the British explorer Sir John Franklin and his 129-member crew, which disappeared in 1845 during a search of the Northwest Passage. Kane returned 18 months later only to discover that his family had learned of his engagement to a woman they believed to be a fraudster, and they were not happy about it. They threatened to disown him, but Elisha didn't surrender. According to Maggie's account in The Love Life of Dr. Kane, the pair married in a Quaker ceremony, attended only by her family and friends. On the eve of the departure, Elisha promised to write to her from England through a secret friend, but sadly, Maggie would never receive those letters. Upon arriving, Elisha became severely ill, and he was sent back across the Atlantic to recover in Cuba, but died in February 1857. And Maggie, whilst waiting for those letters, found out about his death through the newspapers like everyone else. She tried to appeal to his family for a share of his estate as his widow, but they denied the legality of their marriage, and she was thus left with nothing. Without any true financial support, Maggie was forced to return to the hoax with her sisters. By the 1850s, psychics and mystics had become a legitimate vocation, and it was only on the rise. Now, Kate had travelled to England in 1871 for apparent missionary work, as Kate sat only for prominent persons who would let their names be printed as witnesses to the seance. In 1872, she married H.D. Jenkin, a London barrister and spiritualist, but he died just nine years later in 1881, leaving Kate with two sons. In 1876, Maggie had actually joined her sister Kate, but the two fell heavily into drinking, so much so that Leah, back in America, was concerned that Kate could not care for her sons appropriately. This caused a huge rift between the sisters, primarily over alcohol. Maggie's drinking led her back to thinking about her days in Roman Catholicism, as she found herself embroiled in this torment that her powers were evil. On top of that, every day, more and more mediums were being exposed by the press, with journalists deep diving into all the deceptive techniques, from table tipping to spiritual music and perfumes. Maggie felt the mounting pressure of her life story. She realised through her Catholic guilt and her own reflection that a childhood prank that she had conducted when she was only 14 years old had gotten far too out of hand and it was time to come clean. On October the 21st, New Yorkers woke up to a front page story in the New York world, headlined, Spiritualism Exposed, the fox is to sound the death knell of the mediums. The article stated that, quote, the severest blow that spiritualism has ever received is delivered today through a solemn declaration of the greatest medium of the world that it is all a fraud, a deception and a lie, this statement is made by Mrs. Margaret Fox Kane. Through the help of a promoter, Maggie charged an admission fee for her confession in front of the 3,000-seat New York Academy of Music. 
she sat on stage as three doctors held her big toe to see if she moved her leg. If she did, it would prove the raps were a trick. The New York Herald reported that, quote, there stood a black robe, sharp-faced widow, working her big toe, declaring it was in this way that she created the excitement that has driven so many persons to suicide or insanity. As the doctors held her big toe, loud, distinct rappings sounded through the hall. Quote, Mrs. Kane became excited. She clapped her hands, danced about and cried, it's a fraud, spiritualism is a fraud from beginning to end. It's all a trick, there's no proof in it. In just this single statement, the Herald declared that Maggie had destroyed spiritualism for all time. In an exceptionally strange turn of events, Maggie recanted her confession just a year later with the hopes of earning more money from it. But, as you can imagine, she wasn't so successful. Yet, even so, Maggie continued working as a medium until her death in 1893. She died of heart failure at the age of 59. She lived only on charity and was still suffering from alcoholism. Maggie was the last of the sisters to die. Leah, who had separated herself from her sisters, over the disputes of Kate's ability to parent and Maggie's confession to their hoax, had died in 1890 of inflammation of the heart. And Kate had died from kidney disease just a year before Maggie in 1892, back in New York. Even though Maggie had disowned spiritualism, proved in front of everyone that she had been tricking them for decades, and even though papers and scientists and experts came out time and time again to prove that the mediums were lying, People to this day still believe in spiritualism and people still invest in seances. One of the biggest advocates for seances being real was Arthur Conan Doyle himself. He wrote a whole essay trying to disprove Maggie's own denial of her powers by claiming that it was indeed true. What's most interesting is he clings on to any amount of evidence. For example, Bones were allegedly found under the house, and that was his biggest sense of proof that they were telling the truth all those years ago. But in reality, when the bones were analysed later, they just turned out to be animal bones, not humans. And actually, ironically, it's believed that they were planted there decades before by the Fox family themselves in attempts to legitimise the hoax back in the day. I hope you found today's video interesting. If you did, please consider giving it a like and subscribing for more. I hope to give you more scary stories over the winter season. Thank you, as always, to my Patreons for making this possible. And as always, I hope you remain happy and healthy. And books save lives. So keep reading.